Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the webinar, which is the use of satellite, pulsar, subsurface, soil moisture mapping. Just got a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, all attendees' microphones are automatically muted throughout the webinar. Um, please post any questions online. We will attempt to answer as many as possible in the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Any that can't be answered um, due to time constraints, we will attempt to answer them after the webinar. Shortly after the webinar, you will receive a link to a short survey. If you could take a few minutes to provide feedback, please, so we can improve on future webinars, we would all be grateful. I'm going to take a moment just to introduce our two presenters today. We have Eddie Seagal, VP Sales and Business Development at Astera Technology by Utilis. Eddie has been a sales and business development executive in international markets since 2001. In 2010, he switched from defense and IT to water and geotechnical markets. Since then, he has worked with customers in five continents, structurally, technically complex contracts. In the last three years, Eddie has led the diversification of Utilis business, now branded as Astera, into infrastructure risk reduction for transportation, infrastructure and mining by providing subsurface moisture maps. Climate change is hitting hard, especially infrastructure built 50 or more years ago, and introduction of the most advanced technologies is the only way to manage the effects. Before that, Eddie was VP sales in NICE systems, selling advanced technological solutions to large enterprises. Before NICE, Eddie was project manager with Elbit Systems, managing complex integration projects in defense markets. Eddie holds a BSc in Computer Engineering from Technion, Israel Institute of Technology. Moving on to Richard Pidcock, our Joint Managing Director at Central Alliance, part of the RSK Group. Richard is an Engineering Geologist and Company Director with 25 years experience in Engineering Geology, Geotechnical Engineering, Site Investigation and Surveying. Richard founded the business in 2006 and has overseen its growth to become a team of over 100 people delivering ground engineering technical services to clients across all sectors. Central Alliance became part of the RSK Group in 2018 and R&D technology-led solutions are a key focus for the business. And together with Edit, Richard conceived and developed the concept of using high-resolution soil moisture mapping for various applications including geotechnical and drainage assessments for asset management. Richard holds a BSc in Geology from the University of Leicester and an MSc in Engineering Geology from the University of Leeds. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Eddie to begin the presentation. Thanks, Eddie. Thank you very much, Sean. Uh, so, oops, are you sharing the presentation? I don't think so. I don't see it. Okay, here we are. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about the company and then we will go directly into the technology that lays uh, behind the, the soil moisture mapping that uh, Sean mentioned. The company was founded in 2013 by Lorraine Guy. Now the idea came from a program he participated uh, to find water in Mars. This program was uh, sponsored by uh, oh, you closed my webcam, uh, Richard. I don't know if you meant to do that or not. And uh, uh, no, sorry, I've not done that. Uh, okay, I put it back on. No worries. Uh, if you can just uh, click uh, two clicks uh, ahead. Uh, good. So uh, looking for water and mass. Uh, when Loren graduated from the university, he looked for uh, use of this technology on Earth. And the first thing we came about was uh, to find leaks under the streets of our cities. Uh, there's a lot of leakage out there and uh, quite complicated to find. Now, with this technology, uh, we started uh, growing the company. And next, next click. And in 2018, uh, I met uh, Richard and we started working on the subsurface uh, moisture mapping and different uses. And by today, next click, 
uh, today we are a big, big company, 64 employees, offices in various locations around the world, and customers in a variety of uh, vertical markets. So next uh, few slides, I'm going to talk about the technology behind uh, this application. So first of all, to get everyone on the same page, let's talk about the radar principle. Radar is a machine that uh, sends a beam to a target and captures the backscatter. Now imagine that you mount this radar on a satellite. Next click. Uh, now this satellite that you see here is in a fixed polar orbit. Uh, the Earth is rotating, and this is how uh, the satellite with its radar can uh, take pictures of every corner of the world. Now, in the next slide, I'm going to show, uh, we show uh, what is this beam composed of. The beam uh, sends electromagnetic waves, and these electromagnetic waves uh, have polarities, vertical and horizontal. Uh, vertical, like the sea waves, horizontal like snakes and both at the same time is what composed comprises of the electromagnetic wave and you can see uh, up at the top the greek uh, letter uh, lambda which signifies the wavelength and in the next slide i will explain why is this important now the first application that is in the market and there are many suppliers of that application is the INSAR. You see the wave is shot to a target and uh, when it comes back, if there has been subsidence or a heap, then uh, it will be addressed because the there is a shift in the wave phase. Uh, as you can see below in the small picture, there are uh, three types of wavelengths, the C, the X and the L. C and X are relatively short uh, wavelengths. The L band, which is the 23 centimeters wavelength, has two uh, inherent physical characteristics that we take advantage of. One of them is ground penetration, vegetation, everything, and uh, to a certain depth that we don't know how much exactly, but uh, the backscatter that we are getting, now look at this uh, left-hand side picture. This is what Pulsar is all about. We grab the entire uh, backscatter that comes from the ground and we analyze it. Now, why do we call it Pulsar? Because of the polarities. In the next slide, uh, Rich, uh, I will explain how this works. The radar sends a vertical wave or let's start with the H, a, a horizontal wave, and opens two receivers, a horizontal receiver and a vertical receiver. Hence, this chaotic uh, backscatter is orderly recorded in a vertical and in horizontal uh, picture. The second pulse is a vertical pulse, and again, this vertical pulse is backscattered in many directions, and we collect the vertical and the horizontal separately. And at the end of the day, we have a four pictures that have been created from, uh, from the radar. And what is that we do with these uh, four pictures? I will show you in the next slide. Uh, Rich, thank you. And uh, this is how one image looks like, okay? It's very grayish, very difficult to analyze. You cannot read it. And uh, the four polarities that have hit the same target is very much like the exercise that a golfer does when he needs to putt into the hole. He looks from one direction, he looks from another direction in order to understand the curvature of the green. So when you get four pictures or four images acquired from four different polarities, uh, it helps our algorithm to understand what is that we are looking at. 
And then we are able to convert each pixel value into a soil moisture value. And this is what we get on the right hand picture. Uh, the process uh, at the end creates a subsurface a moisture map. Why subsurface? Because the long wavelength that we use is able to penetrate the ground. And uh, therefore, depends on the on where the water is, we get the backscatter and we convert that into a soil moisture map. And uh, in the next slide, you can see uh, you can see what happens when you apply this soil moisture map on the customer infrastructure map. Uh, you get insights that are not uh, available from uh, any other place, uh, like high soil moisture under uh, rail tracks near uh, drainage uh, locations, etc., etc. Now, this subsurface a moisture map actually is the raw material that GroundSat uses and uh, with this now that you have the raw material now Richard will continue and explain what are the different applications available from uh, GroundSat. Thank you. Go ahead Rich. Thanks Eddie. Um, so yeah the, this sort of principal driver behind um, the use of soil moisture data is um, largely linked to uh, asset resilience to, to climate change. Um, so we've seen in recent times extreme weather events are impacting infrastructure, earthworks, uh, assets and, and natural slopes. Um, and, it, and it's that really that we're focusing on when we're trying to use soil moisture data um, proactively. Um, and, the, and the key focus really is a, is a proactive assessment that actually looks at the cause of failures um, rather than the effects, um, such as monitoring ground, ground movement, for example. Um, so a lot of this work, um, as well as driven by and is in line with um, the Sendai framework and the UN Sustainable Development Goals, uh, particularly Global Target D to reduce disaster damage to critical infrastructure and disruption of basic services and Global Target G, uh, which is to increase the availability and access to multi-hazard early warning systems. Uh, and similarly, um, specifically SDG 9, which is the Industry Innovation and Infrastructure um, SDG, uh, it aligns with, with that too. Uh, also increasingly important to asset owners um, and stakeholders is um, TCFD um, compliance um, and assessing uh, the risk of climate change to assets. So in particular, the use of soil moisture data allows us to look at physical risk and in particular, the acute extreme weather events um, that occur um, over a rel relatively or a very short period of time, um, but also looking at more chronic, uh, gradual changes in climate uh, climate over a period of time. So temporal studies over a longer period, and that allows for better risk management and more informed strategic planning. Um, the figures on the right there just illustrate the the extent of the um, growing problem of climate change and the impact of that on critical infrastructure and, and assets. Um, so it's to promote really more informed investment, uh, credit and insurance underwriting decisions, um, the purpose of the TCFD uh, goals. Um, so we've uh, been applying soil moisture data specifically in uh, transportation, uh, mining, the water sector, uh, for flood risk, uh, natural disaster mitigation, and for linear infrastructure such as uh, pipelines. Um, so I've just got a few examples of uh, use cases, um, case studies where we've used Estera's earthwork soil moisture data, and we've analyzed that alongside other data sets um, in, in GIS, in ArcGIS, um, to provide a, an assessment that supports uh, visual inspections and, and other assessments. 
Um, so this project is um, for the Seven Estuary Earthworks uh, scheme for network rail, uh, where the railway runs alongside the Seven Estuary uh, with steep um, weathered rock slopes to one side uh, and the estuary to the other. Um, so we've um, used um, the radar images um, that, that Eddie described, a stereo have processed that and provided the soil moisture mapping. And then we're incorporating that alongside network rails, own LIDAR data, flown LIDAR data, and beyond the extents of that data, we're using open source um, LIDAR data that's freely available um, to create the, the model that we're using in GIS. Um, so the um, the image here shows, um, and, and many of the images throughout this presentation uh, and the other case studies show soil moisture with pixels below a certain value turned off. And that's merely to show the wettest areas more clearly, um, but also to show the underlying um, LIDAR data or aerial imagery, uh, satellite imagery, should that be, uh, be the case. Um, so we completed this study blind and following the study we're provided with Network Rail's locations of the uh, um, slope failure database uh, known as a Civil 95 database. Um, when we overlaid these locations onto our mapping, um, we could see a close correlation between uh, known failure areas and, and our data um, in specific areas. Um, so we um, following on from that, we then uh, did a fairly simple analysis combining slope angle and soil moisture together uh, with the purple um, colouring. And, and this highlights basically where we've got the steepest slopes and highest soil moisture content, content combining together. And you can see that we got, um, again, probably a slightly better correlation with the sub CIV 185 uh, locations. So we then extended this model across the seven kilometer length of the site um, and combined it with a hydrological assessment. Um, the left hand image there shows an example of uh, where we've, we've got topographic wetness index, um, which is using the LIDAR data and showing areas um, that we would expect to be wet based upon the topography. Um, so you can see there on the key, uh, the light blue values are the, the, where we would expect it to be drier, um, moving through purple into pink where we would expect it to be wetter. So you can see clearly there the estuary, obviously we would expect it to be wetter based upon the topography. Um, so Network Rail uh, are using this data now uh, network rail design delivery um, to target interventions along that seven kilometer uh, length of the of the site and that's drainage and slope stabilization interventions uh, obviously budgets don't extend to remediating the full seven kilometer stretch and um, so it's got to be a targeted approach and that's where our data fits in very nicely um, so uh, another interesting aspect to this study um, was uh, related to Estera's background in the water sector and the ability to uh, differentiate um, the difference between treated water and groundwater. Um, algorithms were originally developed um, to look for water leaks as I did described. Um, so there is a, a large amount of work that has gone into that um, ground truthing and it's now a recognised technique among many water companies, including most in the UK. Um, so we uh, also looked at um, treated water leaks uh, in this area. And what was particularly interesting was this, this uh, area that we'd identified as wet from the soil moisture mapping. We'd also identified a, a leak, um, which we believed was at the center point of the of the circles there. Um, so we we drew a cross section um, because there was a swimming pool um, at the crest of the slope um, at a higher level to where we'd identified this leak. And when we drew a cross section between the location of the swimming pool and the area where we'd identified the leak, 
um, we could see there the potential for, for water to um, potentially be leaking from that point where the swimming pool is and tracking down the slope and then emanating uh, at the surface um, at the bottom of the slope, which is uh, roughly the center point of the circles there where we'd identified a leak from, from the satellite mapping. Um, so that's just a, an interesting um, sort of addition to, to the soil moisture mapping um, that we, uh, we used on this project. Um, similarly, um, we've, we've done another study for network rail um, between Dawlish and Timmouth on, for the Southwest Rail Resilience Program. Um, we also acquired some aerial LIDAR data for this study and combined that with open source data uh, beyond the boundaries of that to look at catchment areas as well influencing the slopes. And you can see there we've got similar outputs to what we've got for Seven Estuary with the soil moisture mapping on the left and on the right, the purple uh, images there showing the uh, weighted susceptibility analysis, which is combining slope angle and, and soil moisture together. So this just uh, drills into an area in a bit more detail where there has been um, problems um, relating to flooding due to inundation of the highway drainage um, in this particular area known as, as woodlands. Um, there is a, as you can see there on the, on the image, there's a 12 inch pipe stormwater drain, um, which actually outfalls onto the, um, onto the slope midway. Um, but it's interesting that actually one of these properties um, on the left hand side there, you can see it's got flood barriers uh, installed at the end of the drive which is quite bizarre really considering the location, which is at the uh, top of a cliff um, where you wouldn't necessarily expect flooding to be a, a, a risk. It's near, it's not near any known um, streams or, or, or rivers. Um, so it's uh, quite odd to have flood barriers in that location. Um, as I said, it does um, sort of sit in a, a natural bowl and it's largely due to the inundation of the highways drainage during heavy rainfall events that's causing the problems there. Um, but what's interesting is that we can see this and correlate this directly to um, what we see on the ground, uh, wet areas and the gardens around these houses where uh, water's just been running down the road um, uh, due to the drainage um, becoming uh, inundated and, and the stormwater drain. Um, so it's actually flowing down the surface and into this area, um, which we can see clearly in this, in this data. Um, so just moving a bit further afield in Australia, we've um, just completed a project for Transport for New South Wales. Again, similar principles. Um, the problem here was um, following an extreme weather event in uh, 2021 on the Oxley Highway, there was over 70 slope failures, uh, 10 that were categorized as, as major failures um, along the highway. And this has resulted in the road being closed for a considerable period of time, not just immediately after the, the um, weather event, but ongoing for a period of two years afterwards during construction. Um, to, to carry out the remedial works. Um, so it's estimated two years for construction to get it back to the pre-2021 condition. And you can see there just an extract of the latest news article um, showing closures on the highway for some of these repairs. So the impact is not just around the time of the failure, it's ongoing um, until uh, remedial works are complete. So the solution, um, was uh, that we carried out a, a study using um, STERIS images from both uh, pre-failure and post-failure uh, and compared the two. Uh, the idea being to carry out a back analysis and create a, a proactive modeling tool. So try and use soil moisture data and the analysis of that data to highlight areas of higher susceptibility. And we've got a very close fit between modeled and actual failure locations from this back analysis. So similarly, we've produced soil moisture mapping um, and carried out hydrological analysis 
uh, in GIS, just purely using LIDAR data, so we can compare and analyze both data sets together. And uh, we've also looked at um, other forms of analysis in GIS, so um, the LS factor, uh, which is the image on the left-hand side, uh, combining the S factor, which measures the effect of slope steepness, with the L factor, which defines the impact of slope length. And together, that describes the effect of topography on soil erosion. So we can see where the most susceptible areas are in terms of soil erosion and the potential for um, debris flow type failures during uh, heavy uh, rainfall events. So the, the idea moving on from that is then to produce, as I said, a, a more proactive uh, modeling uh, tool so that we can use soil moisture data proactively. Um, and that's for route-wide asset management. So by um, scaling data, uh, analyzing it and scaling it one to 10, we can essentially produce a map like you see on the right-hand side, which shows higher susceptibility um, based on both the soil moisture data and the, and the uh, other analyses that we carry out. We, we then focus in on these areas that we're identifying as high uh, susceptibility and can carry out a more detailed study as you've seen in uh, the previous case study examples. Um, so just the, finally, the, the, the final case study is um, project again that we've completed uh, recently uh, for the Welsh Government and the Coal Authority and this followed um, the extreme weather event Storm Dennis in 2020 and subsequently the failure of the Tyler's Town um, coal tip uh, which was a 60,000 ton uh, failure uh, and following on from that the um, there was a safety task force established by the Welsh and UK governments um, later that year, actually, there was a second failure at the Wattstown landslip. Um, so the task force was established to address this issue and, um, in particular, um, look at the, the risk of the remaining tips uh, within South Wales. So the, the problem is, again, more extreme weather events resulting in um, increased cultic failures. Also, over the last 50 plus years has been more development, more urbanization at the toe of slopes, uh, and therefore an increase in risk to, to human life and infrastructure. Um, there's also an environmental risk in terms of contamination of rivers and watercourses. Um, and the, the natural topography in this area, obviously the valleys of South Wales, um, means that a lot of these tips were formed on already um, steep natural slopes, um, which is um, part of the the um, problem in this in this area. So there are obviously obvious practical diff difficulties. There are um, just over 2,500 um, legacy coal tips. Uh, all of those have been categorised A to D, um, and there were 256 category C and 69 category D category. D being the highest risk um, rated tips. There are multiple landowners. Um, they are not just owned by local authorities or the coal authority. Um, there are private landowners and there's um, limited um, or even no access in some cases. A physical inspection takes significant time and resource um, and is um, suffers the same limitations as, as inspections on other assets, earthworks assets. Um, such as vegetation uh, and, and simply accessing every area of the site uh, is very time consuming. Um, particularly, you know, when there's a long walk up up natural slopes to just to get to the to the tips. Um, so the solution um, we carried out a study, um, a seasonal study, um, acquiring two images, one in winter and one in in summer. Uh, and we analyzed soil moisture, topography, and land cover um, with a view to identifying areas of high susceptibility um, in terms of both soil moisture, top top topography, and drainage. Um, for this study, we've also 
try to apply the data and, and provide uh, the coal authority with usable information that allows um, inspection, inspecting engineers to utilize the data. Um, so that includes uh, summary sheets that inspecting engineers can take to site and actually validate um, identified features um, such as areas of high soil moisture or, or potentially identified high susceptibility. So for this, we've established um, some metrics as well, seven metrics to statistically analyze um, the data, um, looking at soil moisture, the weight of susceptibility of uh, combining slope angle and soil moisture, and um, a, a drainage path assessment, um, so a stream network assessment based on the topography and the GIS analysis. And also a land cover sensitivity assessment, um, just in terms of management of forested areas, um, which are, are often harvested um, in, in these areas in South Wales. So the potential impact of that harvesting on uh, the catchments, um, the ability to attenuate rainfall and the subsequent runoff from those catchment areas that may influence the tip. And that's allowed us to um, provide a, a matrix which um, gives per, uh, the statistical analysis of each of these um, categories um, with a view to this being used to prioritize um, and target um, inspections, monitoring, and potentially interventions as well. Um, so that's the presentation complete. If there are any questions uh, for either me, Eddie or Sean, um, please feel free to, to put those in the uh, in the chat. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Eddie and Richard. Really insightful presentation. Uh, just while we're waiting for any questions to come in, I will just mention the next webinar in the series, uh, which is the rightful, Right Tools for the Job. And it is on the 11th of August and presented by Eric Downey and Jim Southern of Structural Soils. And just see the first question that just bobbed in. I will send this to Richard, if that's okay. So at what depth in the soil profile is the soil moisture assessed, please? Um, well, that's um, variable uh, depending on ground conditions. Um, there are a number of factors, including the soil moisture itself, the grain size of the soil and vegetation to an extent. Um, so we, we don't know exactly what the depth is. Um, what we can say from both our studies, studies that Estera have carried out uh, at other locations around the world and also some academic research uh, is that typically, um, certainly for typical ground conditions in the UK, we think it's within the upper half a metre um, even 0.3 metres, uh, that provides the closest correlation with ground truth data. Uh, and that's something that I didn't mention in the presentation. The algorithms have been developed on projects where we've carried out ground truthing. So we've, at the same time as the satellite radar image acquisition, within a couple of hour window either side, we've been on site in that location sampled the soil and then tested that in the laboratory for moisture content. And then we've uh, started to review that data to correlate the, the algorithm and, and the, uh, the radar data. That's great, thank you. And we just have one more question at the moment. Uh, we'll pass this over to Eddie, if that's okay. So how is the satellite test and how often can an image be acquired? Please, Eddie. Uh, thank you, Sean. Uh, we work with uh, three satellites at the moment. One is the Japanese, which is the older one. And uh, as long as as soon as we get uh, from the customer the area of interest, uh, we request uh, we send the purchase order to the satellite operator to acquire a specific image that covers the area required. Um, the process takes about two, three weeks, and uh, once uh, we get the image, for us it's a matter of uh, two days and to turn it around. With the Argentinian satellites, uh, it's a constellation of two of them, 
Uh, so we can acquire images every uh, eight days. And uh, because they are newer and uh, more modern, the whole turnaround process is about one week. That's fantastic, thank you. So that concludes all the questions we currently have in. I'll just say a big thank you to all the attendees. Hopefully uh, every, everybody found the presentation insightful. And with that, I think with the lack of any more questions, we will conclude the presentation. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.